How y'all doing? Nice to see you here. Can everybody put their right hand up in the air real quick? Everyone in the right hand? Repeat after me. Say, my voice, my voice has, power has power to speak, to speak my, truth my truth and share, and share my, light. my light. Now put your left hand up in the air real quick. All right. And in Spanish, we're going to say it. Everybody's going to say it. Mi voz, mi voz tiene, poder tiene poder para hablar, para hablar mi, verdad mi verdad y compartir, y compartir mi luz. You just said the same thing in English and Spanish. Clap for yourselves. Yeah. <laughs> Thank y'all so much for being here. I mean, geez, the, the topic's broken, right? It took, it took a lot of courage for a lot of you guys to show up today, right? Listen to poets talk about being broken. <laughs> y'all got courage, right? Give it up for Serenity one more time. We just saw Serenity up there. What we're here to do in a very short amount of time is offer you some context of who we are. We started with our English and Spanish because my name is Will Ritchie. My father's name is Dan Ritchie. He's just a regular white guy from Louisiana. My mother is Jessie Teresa Valcarcel Ritchie from Atorrey, Puerto Rico, and that's where my English and Spanish comes from. My mother's name is Carna Fields. She's from Oak Cliff. That's my hood. <laughs> and my father is from Juncos, Puerto Rico. His name is Alejandro Perez Sr., and I am Alejandro Perez Jr. So little did we know when we met one another, as you can tell, we have a lot in common by our physical makeup, right? <laughs> little did we know that we were both Puerto Rican. It's with that core and that heart that we started Diverse Lounge 11 years ago with about 50 folks in a room at the Dallas Theater Center. And now 11 years later, right here at Life in Deep Ellum, we had over 700 people at our last show. Uh, 50 different schools, almost 100 different kids wanting to read their original material, uh, AP's band, a live painter, live scribe, and it's a really cool intergenerational thing we got, got, got going on, right? Well, another thing that we like to talk about when we talk about broken is we like to talk about mending. So everybody say broken. Broken. Mending. Mending. And Alejandro and I believe through our marriages, through our fatherhood, through our mentoring, throughout this community, that one doesn't come without the other, right? So there will be some hope today and we hope to show that through our performances and everything we do. The second quote I wanna share for you real quick before we go into this performance goes like this. Everyone repeat after me, say, when I share my joy, I multiply my happiness. I multiply my happiness. And when I share my pain, and when I, share my pain I divide my sadness. I divide my sadness. And when I embrace the two, and when I, embrace the two I become whole. I become whole. We, we become whole. I've got this pain in my head, in my mind, in my body, and I really want to let it go. I've got this pain in my head, in my mind, in my body, and I really want to let it go. There's hope, hope, hope. There's hope, hope, hope. There's hope. There's hope. I am a broken man, spends time with a broken clan, searching for pieces of me, pieces of us, prefer not to cause a ruckus with those who refuse to accept their own brokenness, because we find strength in our weakness, complement one another in our incompleteness, and though we often strive for transparency, still wear masks when need be. I've got this pain in my head, in my mind, in my body, and I really want to let it go. I've got this pain in my head, in my mind, in my body, and I really want to let it go. There's hope, hope, hope. There's hope, hope, hope. There's hope. There's hope. Like Sung Tzu in the art of war and the warrior brave hearts. Our art of living is pure, though our hearts often fatigue. For the war of art is paved with intentions, but we have been chosen to overcome. Not by man, but by spirit. In meditation, we hear it calling us from within. Aligning ourselves on the backs of ancestors who pass, we've tiptoed upon to the tops of these totems. For we are soul searchers researchers of healing, bruised and broken, and yet chosen. For it seems like those of us coming apart at the seams are the only ones truly qualified to fight the good fight. 
Because those wound too tightly together cannot accept the vulnerability it takes to face the brokenness we see. Where words spoken are tangible and spoken word is the key where emotional literacy, emotional literacy is the bridge between degrees and the streets where days like these, days like these give us liberation from all that we've seen. Days like these offer emancipation from all that life brings. For we are broken, but mending, fighting, but sending you alive. I am nothing more than a broken man who chooses to spend my time with a broken clan, searching for pieces of me, pieces of us, prefer not to cause a ruckus with those who refuse to accept their own brokenness because we find strength in our weakness. Compliment one another in our incompleteness and though we often strive for transparency, still wear masks when need be. I've got this pain in my head and my mind and my body and I really want to let it go. I've got this pain in my head, in my mind, in my body, and I really want to let it go. Why? There's hope, hope, hope. There's hope, hope, hope. There's hope. There's hope. Diverse Lounge is found on the core of emotional literacy, which we talked about in that piece. Emotional literacy is a bridge, like we said, between degrees in the streets, between introverts and extroverts, between academics and pop culture. And we believe emotional literacy is the place where Alejandro and I have connected, where we have both made sense of our backgrounds and our parents and where we come from, and what we offer our community, not only through workshops and through our shows, but also when we present to adults to recognize, like Maya Angelou said, that the more we share with one another, the more we have in common with one another, right? That's all it really takes. So AP, with that being said, is gonna share a little bit about his story, and then we'll come back around to me. Everybody, five fingers high in the sky one more again. Y'all see this number, five? It's very significant to me, hands down. At five years old, I was happy-go-lucky, having fun, following my favorite cousin in the whole wide world, his name, Eddie Inez Kerr. Green eyes, curly hair, and all the girls would look at him and stare and say, ooh, <laughs> he's so cute. And he had this girlfriend named Margo. Now, Margo was one of the flies you'd ever see. And every time Margo came around, you know you see me. I be like, hey, Marco. She be like, hey, Alex, what you doing? <sighs> Nothing. Just always happy to see Margo. Well, if he went to play basketball, Eddie, I would go play basketball. If he went swimming, I went swimming. As a matter of fact, Eddie taught me how to write my first cursive letter. He taught me the letter L. But I thought the letter was an E, because it looked more like an E to me at five years old. Well, one day, Eddie and I were outside playing football with the boys, and then he had disappeared, and I did not know where he was. So I looked around for him, and I couldn't find him anywhere outside, so I guess maybe I'd go inside. Now, I lived with my great-grandmother, Madea. Now, my dear would make us go to church every single Sunday, and she would make me get up early in the morning. Betty, don't you go in and yonder and make me some coffee and some toast. So that was a regular ritual for me on Sunday morning. I'd always burn her toast, and she'd say, look here, boy, you scrape that black off that toast and bring it down, because we don't waste in my house. Anyway, back on my quest to find my cousin, I'm walking down the hall, and I notice the door is closed. My grandmother's room was on the right, and his room was on the left. He lived in that room with his mother and his sister. His sister, Nikki, his mother, her name, Sarita. Now, Sarita was an enabler, a streetwalker, perhaps. She used to walk the streets at night to make money because she was what we call a cluck or a crackhead. So, 
I walk in the door, and I see my auntie, cousin Sarita, in reality, sitting on the bed with a scale and some crack weighing it. To the left of she was her son. Something in his mouth, he's smoking. Eddie, what you doing? Why you well the door? I looked up at him with that light in my eyes and said, I don't know. And before I knew it, he had taken what he had in his hand, put it in his mouth, grabbed my shoulders, pushed me on the ground and blew. <laughs> and said, breathe. And I took a breath. <coughs> and at the age of five, my favorite cousin in the whole wide world had now violated me with marijuana. Three things entered into my life. Give me three fingers high in the sky. Everybody say fear. Fear. Say it like you mean it. Fear. Fear. Guilt. Guilt. Shame. Shame. They invited themselves into my heart. And at that time, I didn't know what to do. Because if I tell them my favorite cousin in the whole wide world, he was going to get in trouble. I realized at five that I had done something I knew I wasn't supposed to do. And I was afraid to tell my grandmama because I knew that if I did something wrong, grandma pulled that long switch out tied him legs up, and I wasn't trying to make that happen, so I kept my mouth shut. At five years old, I lost my voice. So my voice at that time could not be mobilized to make me powerful. It invited all kind of secrets into my world. And at the age of 14, I allowed myself to be persuaded to do something I should not be doing. There was this man in the neighborhood, everybody knew him endearingly as Jamaican Tony. Jamaican Tony drove a black Mercedes Benz, had money on a regular, had a cellular phone that made you knew he had money on a regular. I want to be like that. I want money in my pocket so they swollen super fat. Hey, so I wanted to be that dude. So naturally, I asked Jamaican Tony, yo, man, will you hook me up? You know what I'm saying? He said, well, yo, I got this house, and I want you to work it. But I can't let you work it unless you find somebody to work the night shift. Because you look like you're a little too young to be working overnight. And I was like, cool. I didn't know who I was going to get to work with me. But lo and behold, that day when opportunity knocks, a door is open. I met this cat named Red, who I'd never met before, who had just gotten out of jail that day. And he said to me he needed a way to make money because he didn't have nowhere to stay. I was like, I got the perfect answer for you, bro. I just hollered at Jamaican Tony today, and he said, if I can get somebody to work the night shift, yo, we can make a fat grill. What it do then? Naturally, we became friends. I told Jamaican Tony about my plan, and we was going to get that money in hand. Now, there was this another cat in my neighborhood. His name was Petey. He really didn't like me because I kind of had a way with the ladies and the ladies that I liked didn't like him. And the ladies that he liked, well, they still liked me. So it was kind of a conflicting situation when it came to our personalities. Anyway, somehow Red and Petey became friends too. That's something I should have thought about. But at the time, all I was thinking about was M-O-N-E, why you ask me? Do I have this money in my pocket? So I didn't think about it. First week went great. We so mad, yay. Got $500 in our pocket, and we had no sweat on our back. Second week went by, and Red was like, yo, man, I'm getting tired of staying in this place by myself, bruh. You need to holler at somebody else, you know what I'm saying? Oh, just clucks coming up overnight. I got to get up out of my sleep to serve them. I said, man, you said you needed a place to stay. Why are you complaining? You got money in your pocket, a place to lay your head. Why are you sweating me? The next day, I rolled by the spot, and Petey's up in there with him. I'm like, what's up? Why Petey here, man? And they ain't got no permission to him being up in this spot. And before I knew it, he pulled out a Glock, put it in my face and said, that money in your pocket, you're going to give me that knot and you're going to give me that G-spot. So I had to give him the G-pack and that knot I had in my pocket. And he said, don't move too quick because I know you got some heat. Get that heat to me. So I had to give him my gun too. They robbed me in the spot. I had to tell Jamaican Tony this happened to me. Man, I 
I won't tell Jamaican Tony. They just took this money and I'm the one introduced them to me. Man, when I called Jamaican Tony, he was pissed off. And I'm gonna tell you in a tone, he told me, look here, youngster. Me don't care about what you saying. You invite the cat to come sell for me. Me tell you right now, me can dead you for what you did. Me don't care what you're talking about. You're gonna go back to the spot, you're gonna make my money. And you'll make my money, me gonna put one in your head. Well, damn. I gotta go back and make money one. for this cat? One. And he tripping? Okay, so I go back. And I'm in the house all by myself, chilling, no gag, and I'm scared as I'll get out, but I gotta make this money. Day's going pretty smooth. I'm watching TV, but not really watching it, just to keep me focused. No sound, and I hear this voice that says, get up. I look around and I don't hear anything at all. I sit back down and I try to stay calm, and I hear this again, it says, get up, get out. So I get up and I go outside and I don't know what to do, but I'm walking down the street and as I'm walking, the voice says to me, ask her to hide you. I don't know who she is, but I'm walking down the street and I find this lady comes out of the smokehouse, which is at the corner of the house. If you don't wanna know what a smokehouse is, it's a place where all crackheads get together and they get high. Anyway, she walks out, I walk to the, to the lot, stand by the tree and she says to me, what you doing, youngster? And I saw Pete and them hit that corner in a white Oldsmobile. When they turned the corner, they turned in front of the house, but I'm on the hill and I could see Petey had a sawed-off shotgun and Red had that 380 they took from me the day before, and they was coming to kill me dead and get the rest of that dough. I asked her to hide me. She told me to go inside. And I went inside the house and I hid. Went down the hallway into the garage and hid under some clothes. I got down on my knees, put the clothes over my head. I began to pray, please, God, please, God, if you let me get out of this situation, I promise, I promise, I promise, I won't ever do this no more. Please, God, please, God. And the next thing you know, I heard, where he at? Where he at? I know he in there. Where he at? And he walked down the hall, and I could hear his footsteps coming, and I was scared as I'll get out. But I had to be still, because I was scared that if he found me, he was going to kill me. And the door opened. <laughs> and he scanned the perimeter. He didn't see me. Then it looked as like he saw me and he looked right into my eyes. And then he closed the door. <coughs> and he walked out. He said, man, he's not in here, man. Let's go. They rolled out. I paid the clerk to send me home. I gave Jamaican Tony his stuff back. And I said, man, I can't do it. They almost killed me. And he said, man, youngster, I'm going to tell you like this. I usually will kill you by this situation. But you were honest enough to tell me what happened. You gave me my stuff back. You stay out the game. If I hear tell you about doing this again, I'm gonna put one in you just on GP. So needless to say, I stopped selling dope. Got back in the church like my grandma and them had me doing. And as I got to the age of 21, I was invited to teach at a school called Africa Care Academy, where I began to discover knowledge of self, realizing that my self-degradation was not helping elevate my community, and decided to be one who advocated for youth, lift up for youth, began to speak my truth, and I told my mother of what happened to me as a kid. This right here was the biggest thing I could have ever did because my mom asked me after I told her what had happened. She said to me, why didn't you tell me? And I said, mom, the reason why I didn't tell you is because if I had told you, I would have broke your heart. You are a single woman working hard trying to take care of your children with what you had. If I had told you that, not only would I have broken your heart, I would have made you hate persons in our families. I forgave my cousin at the age of 21. Unfortunately, he didn't forgive himself. He's now locked up in life for molesting his girlfriend's child. Some people don't heal from the pain they cause because they were caused pain and didn't deal with it. I am thankful and grateful that I had the opportunity to heal from my pain, and now I share my pain with others, not to make them feel bad, but to make them understand it. We can all learn from my pain. Five fingers high in the sky. Say, my voice, my voice has power, has power to speak, to speak my truth, my truth, and share, and share my life, my life. His, his thumbs are tired. 
Walking along all alone, they drive by without notice. Wouldn't dare stop, not for him, wandering creature. Foot by foot, he drags Erica Badu bags on back, in touch with her, within him, and the way on their feet. Heart palpitating profusely in pursuit of bohemian dreams. Friends, family, young couples, old, free spirits and stable, each past the man along paved road, and it's just as well. For the road less traveled like Robert Frost, he chose long ago, no matter the cost, yet in moments of weakness, he still dangles his thumbs to somehow save him from this very fate he has chosen. The Lord works in mysterious ways, they say, and so God doesn't allow Chucker to stop to take Nomad on to rest stop. Never offers op to pick up and drop journeyman and end of the journey. For high atop mountain top, far from paved roads, gravel tops, and firm foot worn past lies the other side of the rainbow. Where those buckled in behind wheel, nestled in the back seat, can only gaze after rain. And though drenched they may be from the downpour, uneasy from blistered toes, aching bones, and fingernails filled with opposite of infatuation, but so lives the journeyman, led by lone in a voice. As each time the clouds part, engulfing those passes by and to the horizon, a wry grin consumes thoughts of his tumultuous trek. And then again, when thumbs are tired, he tucks them in, knowing if he can only keep up with his dreams pushing forward, the rainbow awaits. The rainbow awaits if you can only persevere to the end of the journey. The rainbow awaits. Thank you very much. When I was five years old, I can't say that my voice was lost. And the reason I can't say that is because my mother lost her voice as soon as she came here to the United States. My father, a beautiful person, grew up playing basketball, played basketball with Pistol Pete Maravich at LSU. Wanted me to be a basketball player and had all kind of other dreams like many of our parents do. But he asked my mother not to speak Spanish to us in the house. And so as the oldest of four children, we grew up speaking English only in this little small town in Louisiana called Faraday. Faraday was famous for three cousins, Mickey Gilly, Jerry Lee Lewis, and the Honorable Jimmy Swaggart. And there was my mom, the only Latin person in the town. This draws to the end of our presentation because I don't need as many words to tell my story. Even though my story resonates perhaps with many of you here or some of you. Because the quietness, right? And the lack of drama, right? And the lack of professed trauma, right? In the suburbs often goes unspoken. Diverse Lounge is a place where all of our stories can be heard. We're incredibly articulate stories like Alejandro's are said and embraced and where the quiet people like myself when I was a child can come and learn how to speak our voice. Megan asked us how we would contextualize and connect our presentation to you today. And this is exactly how we hope to do. Performing a couple of pieces, giving you AP's story, and then allowing you to hear from me in a very short way that exactly what he went through is what I went through, even if it was with a polo shirt on and khaki shorts. <laughs> I don't have to mention how one of my family members was abducted at a young age. I don't have to mention how alcoholism and drug addiction and mental illness, both diagnosed and undiagnosed, penetrated our family. And I don't have to mention how that silence at some point implodes, right? And so many of us drift away from where we were raised and this 
plight that we see across the country, right? Where our families live in one state, we live in another state, and things like that. What I do want to say, though, is pain is pain, right? If you watch the Olympics, you only hear, like, the really overt stories, right? The guy with one leg ran a marathon, you know? Like, you never hear these other stories. And so I think it's a beautiful opportunity to be at a place like this, Creative Mornings, to share through what we do say and what we don't say that Alejandro and I have formed a brotherhood that has a bond unlike many I've ever known. But we all have a story, whether it's overt or not. Yeah? Can you repeat after me real quick to say pain is pain? Pain is pain. Pain is pain. When I shared that quote earlier, and you guys have been seeing, we're trying to accomplish like a lot, right? In a short amount of time, you guys are seeing quotes, you guys are seeing pictures. All of these quotes that you're seeing up there, right, are from our show. All of these quotes that you're seeing are, are things that we share when we do our workshops and assemblies across North Texas. And everything has led into where we are now, and if I may, Megan and Joe, if that's okay, um, because of our kind of like, uh, uh, I guess, I don't know, slow way of impacting culture over 11 years. Um, I was the artistic director of the Dallas Festival of Ideas uh, the last couple years. And this year we had an extraordinary video uh, that opened our festival. It has almost 10,000 hits. Uh, you may have seen it around town. Alejandro and I are not the writers or the poets in there. We're definitely not the videographers. But um, we like to think that we've had a big uh, part in allowing this type of culture to be presented to show a different face at Dallas. So if we can share that video and then we'll go into our Q&A.